Introduction of My Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Introduction what is the idea? We have only started on our development of our country. We have not as yet, with all our talk of wonderful progress, done more than scratch the surface. The progress has been wonderful enough, but when we compare what we have done with what there is to do, then our past accomplishments are as nothing. When we consider that more power is used merely in plowing the soil, than is used in all the industrial establishments of the country put together, an inkling comes of how much opportunity there is ahead. And now, with so many countries of the world in ferment, and with so much unrest everywhere, is an excellent time to suggest something of the things that may be done in the light of what has been done. When one speaks of increasing power, machinery, and industry, there comes up a picture of cold, metallic sort of world, in which great factories will drive away the trees, the flowers, the birds, and the green fields, and that then we shall have a world composed of metal machines and human machines. With all of that, I do not agree. I think that unless we know more about machines and their use, unless we better understand the mechanical portion of life, we cannot have the time to enjoy the trees and the birds and the flowers and the green fields. I think that we have already done too much toward banishing the pleasant things from life by thinking that there is some opposition between living and providing the means of living. We waste so much time and energy that we have little left over in which to enjoy ourselves. Power and machinery, money and goods, are useful only as they set us free to live. They are but means to an end. For instance, I do not consider the machines which bear my name simply as machines. If that was all there was to it, I would do something else. I take them as concrete evidence of the working out of a theory of business, which I hope is something more than a theory of business, a theory that looks toward making this world a better place in which to live. The fact that the commercial success of the Ford Motor Company has been most unusual is important only because it serves to demonstrate, in a way which no one can fail to understand, that the theory to date is right. Considered solely in this light, I can criticize the prevailing system of industry and the organization of money and society from the standpoint of one who has not been beaten by them. As things are now organized, I could, were I thinking only selfishly, ask for no change. If I merely want money, the present system is all right. It gives money in plenty to me. But I am thinking of service. The present system does not permit of the best service because it encourages every kind of waste. It keeps many men from getting the full return from service. And it is going nowhere. It is all a matter of better planning and adjustment. I have no quarrel with the general attitude of scoffing at new ideas. It is better to be skeptical of all new ideas and to insist upon being shown rather than to rush around in a continuous brainstorm after every new idea. Skepticism, if by that we mean cautiousness, is the balance wheel of civilization. Most of the present acute troubles of the world arise out of taking on new ideas without first carefully investigating to discover if they are good ideas. An idea is not necessarily good because it is old, or necessarily bad because it is new, but if an old idea works, then the weight of the evidence is all in its favor. Ideas are of themselves extraordinarily valuable, but an idea is just an idea. Almost anyone can think up an idea. 
The thing that counts is developing it into a practical product. I am now most interested in fully demonstrating that the ideas we have put into practice are capable of the largest application, that they have nothing peculiarly to do with motor cars or tractors, but form something in the nature of a universal code. I am quite certain that it is the natural code, and I want to demonstrate it so thoroughly that it will be accepted, not as a new idea, but as a natural code. The natural thing to do is to work, to recognize that prosperity and happiness can be obtained only through honest effort. Human ills flow largely from attempting to escape from this natural course. I have no suggestion which goes beyond accepting in its fullest this principle of nature. I take it for granted that we must work. All that we have done comes as the result of a certain insistence that since we must work, it is better to work intelligently and forehandedly, that the better we do our work, the better off we shall be, all of which I conceive to be merely elemental common sense. I am not a reformer. I think there is entirely too much attempt at reforming in the world, and that we pay too much attention to reformers. We have two kinds of reformers. Both are nuisances. The man who calls himself a reformer wants to smash things. He is the sort of man who would tear up a whole shirt because the collar button did not fit the buttonhole. It would never occur to him to enlarge the buttonhole. This sort of reformer never under any circumstances knows what he is doing. Experience and reform do not go together. A reformer cannot keep his zeal at white heat in the presence of a fact. He must discard all facts. Since 1914, a great many persons have received brand new intellectual outfits. Many are beginning to think for the first time. They open their eyes and realize that they were in the world. Then, with a thrill of independence, they realize that they could look at the world critically. They did so and found it faulty. The intoxication of assuming the masterful position of a critic of the social system, which it is every man's right to assume, is unbalancing at first. The very young critic is very much unbalanced. He is strongly in favor of wiping out the old order and starting a new one. They actually manage to start a new world in Russia. It is there that the work of the world makers can best be studied. We learn from Russia that it is the minority and not the majority who determine destructive action. We learn also that while men may decree social laws in conflict with natural laws, nature vetoes those laws more ruthlessly than did the czars. Nature has vetoed the whole Soviet Republic, for it sought to deny nature. It denied above all else the right to the fruits of labor. Some people say, Russia will have to go to work. But that does not describe the case. The fact is that poor Russia is at work, but her work counts for nothing. It is not free work. In the United States, a workman works eight hours a day. In Russia, he works twelve to fourteen. In the United States, if a workman wishes to lay off a day or a week and is able to afford it, there is nothing to prevent him. In Russia, under Sovietism, the workman goes to work whether he wants to or not. The freedom of the citizen has disappeared in the discipline of a prison-like monotony in which all are treated alike. That is slavery. Freedom is the right to work a decent length of time, and to get a decent living for doing so, to be able to arrange the little personal details of one's own life. It is the aggregate of these and many other items of freedom which makes up the great idealistic freedom. The minor forms of freedom lubricate the everyday life of all of us. Russia could not get along without intelligence and experience. As soon as she began to run her factories by committees, they went to rack and ruin. 
there was more debate than production. As soon as they threw out the skilled man, thousands of tons of precious materials were spoiled. The fanatics talked the people into starvation. The Soviets are now offering the engineers, the administrators, the foremen and superintendents, whom at first they drove out, large sums of money, if only they will come back. Bolshevism is now crying for the brains and experience which it yesterday treated so ruthlessly. All that reform did to Russia was to block production. There is, in this country, a sinister element that desires to creep in between the men who work with their hands and the men who think and plan for the men who work with their hands. The same influence that drove the brains, experience, and ability out of Russia is busily engaged in raising prejudice here. We must not suffer the stranger, the destroyer, the hater of happy humanity, to divide our people. In unity is American strength and freedom. On the other hand, we have a different kind of reformer who calls himself one. He is singularly like the radical reformer. The radical has no experience and does not want it. The other class of reformer has had plenty of experience, but it does him no good. I refer to the reactionary, who will be surprised to find himself put in exactly the same class as the Bolshevist. He wants to go back to some previous condition, not because it was the best condition, but because he thinks he knows about that condition. The one crowd wants to smash up the whole world in order to make a better one. The other holds the world as so good that it might well be let stand as it is, and decay. The second notion arises as does the first, out of not using the eyes to see with. It is perfectly possible to smash this world, but it is not possible to build a new one. It is possible to prevent the world from going forward, but it is not possible then to bring it from going back, from decaying. It is foolish to expect that, if everything be overturned, everyone will thereby get three meals a day, or, should everything be petrified, that thereby six percent interest may be paid. The trouble is that reformers and reactionaries alike get away from the realities, from the primary functions. One of the counsels of caution is to be very certain that we do not mistake a reactionary turn for a return of common sense. We have passed through a period of fireworks of every description and the making of a great many idealistic maps of progress. We did not get anywhere. It was a convention, not a march. Lovely things were said, but when we got home we found the furnace out. Reactionaries have frequently taken advantage of the recoil from such a period, and they have promised the good old times, which usually means the bad old abuses, and because they are perfectly void of vision, they are sometimes regarded as practical men. Their return to power is often hailed as the return of common sense. The primary functions are agriculture, manufacture, and transportation. Community life is impossible without them. They hold the world together. Raising things, making things, and earning things are as primitive as human need, and yet as modern as anything can be. They are of the essence of physical life. When they cease, community life ceases. Things do get out of shape in this present world under the present system, but we may hope for a betterment if the foundations stand sure. The great delusion is that one may change the foundation, usurp the part of destiny in the social process, the foundations of society are the men and means to grow things, to make things, and to carry things. As long as agriculture, manufacture, and transportation survive, the world can survive any economic or social change. As we serve our jobs, we serve the world. 
There is plenty of work to do. Business is merely work. Speculation in things already produced, that is not business. It is more or less respectable graft. But it cannot be legislated out of existence. Laws can do very little. Law never does anything constructive. It can never be more than a policeman, and so it is a waste of time to look to our state capitals or to Washington to do that which law was not designed to do. As long as we look to legislation to cure poverty or to abolish special privilege, we are going to see poverty spread and special privilege grow. We have had enough of looking to Washington, and we have had enough of legislators. Not so much, however, in this as in other countries, promising laws to do that which laws cannot do. When you get a whole country, as did ours, thinking that Washington is a sort of heaven and behind its clouds dwell omniscience and omnipotence, you are educating that country into a dependent state of mind which augurs ill for the future. Our help does not come from Washington, but from ourselves. Our help may, however, go to Washington as a sort of central distribution point where all our efforts are coordinated for the general good. We may help the government. The government cannot help us. The slogan of less government in business and more business in government is a very good one not mainly on account of business or government, but on account of the people. Business is not the reason why the United States was founded. The Declaration of Independence is not a business charter, nor is the Constitution of the United States a commercial schedule. The United States, its land, people, government, and business, are but methods by which the life of the people is made worth while. The government is a servant and never should be anything but a servant. The moment the people become adjuncts to government, then the law of retribution begins to work. For such a relation is unnatural, immoral, and inhuman. We cannot live without business, and we cannot live without government. Business and government are necessary as servants, like water and grain. As masters, they overturn the natural order. The welfare of the country is squarely up to us as individuals. This is where it should be, and that is where it is safest. Governments can promise something for nothing, but they cannot deliver. They can juggle the currencies as they did in Europe, and as bankers the world over do, as long as they can get the benefits of the juggling, with a patter of solemn nonsense. But it is work, and work alone, that can continue to deliver the goods, and that, down in his heart, is what every man knows. There is little chance of an intelligent people, such as ours, ruining the fundamental process of economic life. Most men know they cannot get something for nothing. Most men feel, even if they do not know, that money is not wealth. The ordinary theories which promise everything to everybody and demand nothing from anybody are promptly denied by the instincts of the ordinary man, even when he does not find reasons against them. He knows that they are wrong. That is enough. The present order, always clumsy, often stupid, and in many ways imperfect, has this advantage over any other. It works. Doubtless our order will merge by degrees into another, and the new one will also work, but not so much by reason of what it is as by reason of what men will bring into it. The reason why Bolshevism did not work, and cannot work, is not economic. It does not matter whether industry is private, no matter what the value of crops. Have we failed to turn a first-class profit? We are not farmers. We are industrialists on the farm. The moment the farmer considers himself an industrialist, 
with a horror of waste either in material or in men, then we are going to have farm products so low priced that all will have enough to eat and the profits will be so satisfactory that farming will be considered as among the least hazardous and most profitable of occupations. Lack of knowledge of what is going on and lack of knowledge of what the job really is and the best way of doing it are the reasons why farming is thought not to pay. Nothing could pay the way farming is conducted. The farmer follows his luck and his forefathers. He does not know how economically to produce, and he does not know how to market. A manufacturer who knew how neither to produce nor to market would not long stay in business. That the farmer can stay on shows how wonderfully profitable farming can be. The way to attain low-priced, high-volume production in the factory or on the farm, and low-priced, high-volume production means plenty for everyone, is quite simple. The trouble is that the general tendency is to complicate very simple affairs. Take, for instance, an improvement. When we talk about improvements, usually we have in mind some change in a product. An improved product is one that has been changed. That is not my idea. I do not believe in starting to make until I have discovered the best possible thing. This, of course, does not mean that a product should never be changed, but I think that it will be found more economical in the end not even to try to produce an article until you have fully satisfied yourself that utility, design, and material are the best. If your researches do not give you that confidence, then keep right on searching until you find confidence. The place to start manufacturing is with the article. The factory, the organization, the selling, and the financial plans will shape themselves to the article. You will have a cutting edge on your business chisel, and in the end you will save time. Rushing into manufacturers were of the crudest. There is an immense amount to be learned simply by tinkering with things. It is not possible to learn from books how everything is made, and a real mechanic ought to know how nearly everything is made. Machines are to a mechanic what books are to a writer. He gets ideas from them, and if he has any brains, he will apply those ideas. From the beginning, I never could work up much interest in the labor of farming. I wanted to have something to do with machinery. My father was not entirely in sympathy with my bent towards mechanics. He thought that I ought to be a farmer. When I left school at seventeen and became an apprentice in the machine shop of the dry dock engine works, I was all but given up for lost. I passed my apprenticeship without trouble. That is, I was qualified to be a machinist long before my three-year term had expired, and having a liking for fine work and a leaning towards watches, I worked nights at repairing in a jewelry shop. At one point of those early years, I think that I must have had fully three hundred watches. I thought I could build a serviceable watch for around thirty cents, and nearly started in the business. But I did not, because I figured out that watches were not universal necessities, and therefore people generally would not buy them. Just how I reached that surprising conclusion, I am unable to state. I did not like the ordinary jewelry and watchmaking work excepting where the job was hard to do. Even then, I wanted to make something in quantity. It was just about the time when the standard railroad time was being arranged. We had formerly been on sun time, and for quite a while, just as in our present daylight saving days, the railroad time differed from the local time. That bothered me a good deal, and so I succeeded in making a watch that kept both times, 
It had two dials, and it was quite a curiosity in the neighborhood. In 1879, that is, about four years after I first saw that Nichols Shepherd machine, I managed to get a chance to run one, and when my apprenticeship was over, I worked with a local representative of the Westinghouse Company of Schenectady as an expert in the setting up and repair of the road engines. The engine they put out, to be more accurate, the motor simply was not cooled at all. I found that on a run of an hour or more, the motor heated up, and so I very shortly put a water jacket around the cylinders and piped it to a tank in the rear of the car over the cylinders. Nearly all of these various features had been planned in advance. That is the way I have always worked. I draw a plan and work out every detail on the plan before starting to build. For otherwise, one will waste a great deal of time in makeshifts as the work goes on, and the finished article will not have coherence. It will not be rightly proportioned. Many inventors fail because they do not distinguish between planning and experimenting. The largest building difficulties that I had were in obtaining the proper materials. The next were with tools. There had to be some adjustments and changes in details of the design, but what held me up most was that I had neither the time nor the money to search for the best material for each part. But in the spring of 1893, the machine was running to my partial satisfaction and giving an opportunity further to test out the design and material on the road. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2. What I Learned About Business My gasoline buggy was the first, and for a long time, the only automobile in Detroit. It was considered to be something of a nuisance, for it made a racket and it scared horses. Also, it blocked traffic, for if I stopped my machine anywhere in town, a crowd was around it before I could start up again. If I left it alone, even for a minute, some inquisitive person always tried to run it. Finally, I had to carry a chain and chain it to a lamp post whenever I left it anywhere, and then there was trouble with the police. I do not know why it placed. Any return should come after it has produced, not before. Businessmen believed that you could do anything by financing it. If it did not go through on the first financing, then the idea was to refinance. The process of refinancing was simply the game of sending good money after bad. In the majority of cases, the need of refinancing arises from bad management, and the effect of refinancing is simply to pay the poor managers to keep up their bad management a little longer. It is merely a postponement of the day of judgment. This makeshift of refinancing is a device of speculative financers. Their money is no good to them unless they can connect it up with a place where real work is being done, and that they cannot do unless, somehow, that place is poorly managed. Thus, the speculative financers delude themselves that they are putting their money out to use. They are not. They are just putting it out to waste. I determined absolutely that never I would join a company in which finance came before the work or in which bankers or financers had a part. And further that, if there were no way to get started in the kind of business that I thought could be managed in the interest of the public, 
then I simply would not get started at all. From my own short experience, together with what I saw going on around me, was quite enough proof that business as a mere money-making game was not worth giving much thought to, and was distinctly no place for a man who wanted to accomplish anything. Also, it did not seem to me to be the way to make money. I have yet to have it demonstrated that it is the way, for the only foundation of real business is service. A manufacturer is not through with his customer when a sale is completed. He has then only started with his customer. In the case of an automobile, the sale of a machine is only something in the nature of an introduction. If the machine does not give service, then it is better for the manufacturer if he never had the introduction, for he will have the worst of all advertisements, a dissatisfied customer. There was something more than a tendency in the early days of the automobile to regard the selling of a machine as the best all-round service and then arrange to manufacture at the very highest quality and sell at the very lowest price, you will be meeting a demand which is so large that it may be called universal. This is not standardizing. The use of the word standardizing is very apt to lead one into trouble, for it implies a certain freezing of design and method, and usually works out so that the manufacturer selects whatever article he can the most easily make and sell at the highest profit. The public is not considered either in the design or in the price. The thought behind most standardization is to be able to make a larger profit. The result is that with the economies which are inevitable if you make only one thing, a larger and larger profit is continually being had by the manufacturer. His output also becomes larger. His facilities produce more, and before he knows it, his markets are overflowing with goods which will not sell. These goods would sell if the manufacturer would take a lower price for them. There is always buying power present, but that buying power will not always respond to reductions in price. If an article has been sold at too high a price, and then, because of stagnant business, the price is suddenly cut, the response is sometimes most disappointing. And for a very good reason, the public is wary. It thinks that the price cut is a fake, and it sits around waiting for a real cut. We saw much of that last year. If, on the contrary, the economies of making are transferred at once to the price, and if it is well known that such is the policy of the manufacturer, the public will have confidence in him and will respond. They will trust him to give honest value. So standardization may seem bad business unless it carries with it the plan of constantly reducing the price at which the article is sold. And the price has to be reduced. This is very important because of the manufacturing economies that have come about and not because the falling demand by the public indicates that it is not satisfied with the price. The public should always be wondering how it is possible to give so much for the money. Standardization, to use the word as I understand it, is not just taking one's best selling article and concentrating on it. It is to refresh your brain with the luxury of much outdoorness and your lungs with the tonic of tonics, the right kind of atmosphere. It is your say, too, when it comes to speed. You can, if you choose, loiter lingeringly through shady avenues, or you can press down on the foot lever until all the scenery looks alike to you, and you have to keep your eyes skinned to count the milestones as they pass. I am giving the gist of this advertisement to show that, from the beginning, we were looking to provide service. We never bothered with a sporting car. The business went along almost as by magic. The cars gained a reputation for standing up. 
they were tough, they were simple, and they were well made. I was working on my design for a universal single model, but I had not settled on the designs, nor had we the money to build and equip the proper kind of plant for manufacturing. I had not the money to discover the very best and lightest materials. We still had to accept the materials that the market offered. We got the best to be had, but we had no facilities for the scientific investigation of materials or for original research. My associates were not convinced that it was possible to restrict our cars to a single model. The automobile trade was following the old bicycle trade, in which every manufacturer thought it necessary to bring out a new model each year, and to make it so unlike all previous models that those who had bought the former models would want to get rid of the old and buy the new. That was supposed to be good business. It is the same idea that women submit to in their clothing and hats. That is not service. It seeks only to provide something new, not something better. It is extraordinary how firmly rooted is the notion that business, continuous selling, depends not on satisfying the customer once and for all, but on first getting his money for one article and then persuading him he ought to buy a new and different one. The plan which I then had in the back of my head, but to which we were not then sufficiently advanced to give expression, was that, when a model was settled upon, then every improvement on that model should be to the outcome, but nevertheless it was a sword hanging over our heads that we could as well do without. Prosecuting that suit was probably one of the most short-sighted acts that any group of American businessmen has ever combined to commit. Taken in all its sidelights, it forms the best possible example of joining unwittingly to kill a trade. I regard it as most fortunate for the automobile makers of the country that we eventually won, and the association ceased to be a serious factor in the business. By 1908, however, in spite of this suit, we had come to a point where it was possible to announce and put into fabrication the kind of car that I wanted to build. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of My Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 4. The Secret of Manufacturing and Serving Now, I am not outlining the career of the Ford Motor Company for any personal reason. I am not saying, go thou and do likewise. What I am trying to emphasize is that the ordinary way of doing business is not the best way. I am coming to the point of my entire departure from the ordinary methods. From this point dates the extraordinary success of the company. We had been fairly following the custom of the trade. Our automobile was less complex than any other. We had no outside money in the concern, but aside from these two points, we did not differ materially from the other automobile companies, excepting that we had been somewhat more successful and had rigidly pursued the policy of taking all cash discounts, putting our profits back into the business, and maintaining a large cash balance. We entered cars in all of the races. We advertised and we pushed our 111 people in the first year, built 1,708 cars, and had one branch house. In 1908, 
the factory space had increased to 2.65 acres, and we owned the building. The average number of employees had increased to 1,908. We built 6,181 cars and had 14 branch houses. It was a prosperous business. During the season 1908 to 1909, we continued to make models R and S, four-cylinder runabouts and roadsters, the models that had previously been so successful, and which sold at $700 and $750. But Model T swept them right out. We sold 10,607 cars, a larger number than any manufacturer had ever sold. The price for the touring car was $850. On the same chassis, we mounted a town car at $1,000, a roadster at $825, a coupe at $950, and a landaulet at $950. This season demonstrated conclusively to me that it was time to put the new policy in force. The salesmen, before I had announced the policy, were spurred by the great sales to think that even greater sales might be had if only we had more models. It is strange how, just as soon as an article becomes successful, somebody starts to think that it would be more successful if only it were different. There is a tendency to keep monkeying with styles and to spoil a good thing by changing it. The salesmen were insistent on increasing the line. They listened to the 5%, the special customers who could say what they wanted, and forgot all about the 95%, who just bought without making any fuss. No business can improve unless it pays the closest possible attention to complaints and suggestions. If there is any defect in service, then that must be instantly and rigorously investigated. But when the suggestion is only as to style, one has to make sure whether it is not merely a personal whim that is being voiced. Salesmen always want to cater to whims, instead of see how, under such conditions, the men could possibly be paid more than ten or twenty cents a day. For, of course, it is not the employer who pays wages. He only handles the money. It is the product that pays the wages and is the management that arranges the production so that the product may pay the wages. The more economical methods of production did not begin all at once. They began gradually, just as we began gradually to make our own parts. Model T was the first motor that we made ourselves. The great economies began in assembling and then extended to other sections so that, while today we have skilled mechanics in plenty, they do not produce automobiles. They make it easy for others to produce them. Our skilled men are the tool makers, the experimental workmen, the machinists, and the pattern makers. They are as good as any men in the world. So good, indeed, that they should not be wasted in doing that which the machines they contrive can do better. The rank and file of men come to us unskilled. They learn their jobs within a few hours or a few days. If they do not learn within that time, they will never be of any use to us. These men are, many of them, foreigners, and all that is required before they are taken on is that they should be potentially able to do enough work to pay the overhead charges on the floor space they occupy. They do not have to be able-bodied men. We have jobs that require great physical strength, although they are rapidly lessening. We have other jobs that require no strength whatever, jobs which, as far as strength is concerned, might be attended to by a child of three. It is not possible, without going deeply into technical processes, to present the whole development of manufacturing, step by step, 
in the order in which each thing came about. I do not know that this could be done, because something has been happening nearly every day, and nobody can keep track. Take at random a number of the changes. From them, it is possible not only to gain some idea of what will happen when this world is put on a production basis, but also to see how much more we pay for things than we ought to, and how much lower wages are than they ought to be, and what a vast field remains to be explored, to how good and how efficient he is. Thinking always ahead, thinking always of trying to do more, brings a state of mind in which nothing is impossible. The moment one gets into the expert state of mind, a great number of things become impossible. I refuse to recognize that there are impossibilities. I cannot discover that anyone knows enough about anything on this earth definitely to say what is and what is not possible. The right kind of experience, the right kind of technical training, ought to enlarge the mind and reduce the number of impossibilities. It unfortunately does nothing of the kind. Most technical training, and the average of that which we call experience, provide a record of previous failures, and, instead of these failures being taken for what they are worth, they are taken as absolute bars to progress. If some man, calling himself an authority, says that this or that cannot be done, then a horde of unthinking followers start the chorus. It can't be done. Take castings. Castings has always been a wasteful process, and is so old that it has accumulated many traditions, which make improvements extraordinarily difficult to bring about. I believe one authority on molding declared, before we started our experiments, that any man who said he could reduce costs within half a year wrote himself down as a fraud. Our foundry used to be much like other foundries. When we cast the first Model T cylinders in 1910, everything in the place was done by hand. Shovels and wheelbarrows abounded. The work was then either skilled or unskilled. We had molders and we had laborers. Now we have about 5% of thoroughly skilled molders and coarse setters, but the remaining 95% are unskilled, or to put it more accurately, must be skilled in exactly one operation which the most stupid man can learn within two days. The molding is all done by machinery. Each part which we have to cast has a unit or units of its own, according to the number required in the plan of production. The machinery of the unit is adapted to the single casting. Thus, the men in the unit each perform a single operation that is always the same. The unit can... There used to be a lot of advice given to officials not to hide behind their titles. The very necessity for the advice showed a condition that needed more than advice to correct it. And the correction is just this. Abolish the titles. A few may be legally necessary... A few may be useful in directing the public how to do business with the concern, but for the rest, the best rule is simple. Get rid of them. As a matter of fact, the record of business in general just now is such as to detract very much from the value of titles. No one would boast of being president of a bankrupt bank. Business on the whole has not been so skillfully steered as to leave much margin for pride in the steersmen. The men who bear titles now and are worth anything are forgetting their titles and are down in the foundation of business looking for the weak spots. They are back again in the places from which they rose, trying to reconstruct from the bottom up. And when a man is really at work, he needs no title. His work honors him. All of our men come into the factory or the offices through the employment departments. As I have said, we do not hire experts. 
Neither do we hire men on past experiences or for any position other than the lowest. Since we do not take a man on his past history, we do not refuse him because of his past history. I never met a man who was thoroughly bad. There is always some good in him, if he gets a chance. That is the reason we do not care in the least about a man's antecedents. We do not hire a man's history, we hire the man. If he has been in jail, that is no reason to say that he will be in jail again. I think, on the contrary, he is, if given a chance, very likely to make a special effort to keep out of jail. Our employment office does not bar a man for anything he has previously done. He is equally acceptable whether he has been in Sing Sing or at Harvard, and we do not even inquire from which place he has graduated. All that he needs is a desire to work. If he does not desire to work, it is very unlikely that he will apply for a position, for it is pretty well understood that a man give him signals. None of our machines is ever built haphazardly. The idea is investigated in detail before a move is made. Sometimes wooden models are constructed, or again the parts are drawn to full size on a blackboard. We are not bound by precedent, but we leave nothing to luck, and we have yet to build a machine that will not do the work for which it was designed. About 90% of all experiments have been successful. Whatever expertness in fabrication that has developed has been due to men. I think that if men are unhampered and they know that they are serving, they will always put all of mind and will into even the most trivial of tasks. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of My Life and Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 7. The Terror of the Machine. Repetitive labor, the doing of one thing over and over again, and always in the same way, is a terrifying prospect to a certain kind of mind. It is terrifying to me. I could not possibly do the same thing day in and day out, but to other minds, perhaps I might say to the majority of minds, repetitive operations hold no terrors. In fact, to some types of mind, thought is absolutely appalling. To them, the ideal job is one where the creative instinct needs not be expressed. The jobs where it is necessary to put in mind, as well as muscle, have very few takers. We always need men who like a job because it is difficult. The average worker, I am sorry to say, wants a job in which he does not have to put forth much physical exertion. Above all, he wants a job in which he does not have to think. Those who have what might be called the creative type of mind and who thoroughly abhor monotony are apt to imagine they were able to receive their regular wages. In fact, their production was about 20%, I believe, above the usual shop production. No man had to do the work unless he wanted to. But they all wanted to. It kept time from hanging on their hands. They slept and ate better and recovered more rapidly. No particular consideration has to be given to deaf and dumb employees. They do their work 100%. The tubercular employees, and there are usually about a thousand of them, mostly work in the material salvage department. Those cases which are considered contagious work together in an especially constructed shed. 
The work of all of them is largely out of doors. At the time of the last analysis of employed, there were 9,563 substandard men. Of these, 123 had crippled or amputated arms, forearms, or hands. One had both hands off. There were four totally blind men, 207 blind in one eye, 253 with one eye nearly blind, 37 deaf and dumb, 60 epileptics, four with both legs or feet missing, 234 with one foot or leg missing. The others had minor impediments. The length of time required to become proficient in the various occupations is about as follows. 43% of all the jobs require not over one day of training, 36% require from one day to one week, 6% require from one to two weeks, 14% require from one month to one year, 1% require from one to six years. The last jobs require great skill, as in tool making and die sinking. The discipline throughout the plant is rigid. There are no petty rules, and no rules the justice of which can reasonably be disputed. The injustice of arbitrary discharge is avoided by confining the right of discharge to the employment manager, and he rarely exercises it. The year 1919 is the last on which statistics were kept. In that year, 30,155 changes occurred. Of those, 10,334 were absent more than 10 days without notice and therefore dropped. What ought the employer to pay? What ought the employee to receive? These are but minor questions. The basic question is, what can the business stand? Certainly no business can stand outgo that exceeds income. When you pump water out of a well at a faster rate than the water flows in, the well goes dry. And when the well runs dry, those who depend on it go thirsty. And if, perchance, they imagine they can pump one well dry and then jump to some other well, it is only a matter of time when all the wells will be dry. There is now a widespread demand for more justly divided rewards, but it must be recognized that there are limits to rewards. The business itself sets the limits. You cannot distribute $150,000 out of a business that brings in only $100,000. The business limits the wages, but does anything limit the business? The business limits itself by following bad precedents. If men, instead of saying, the employer ought to do thus and so, would say, the business ought to be so stimulated and managed that it can do thus and so, they would get somewhere, because only the business can pay wages. Certainly the employer cannot, unless the business warrants. But if that business does warrant higher wages, and the employer refuses, what is to be done? As a rule, a business means the livelihood of too many men to be tampered with. It is criminal to assassinate a business to which large numbers of men have given their labors and to which they have learned to look as their field of usefulness and their source of livelihood. Killing the business by a strike or a lockout does not help. The employer can gain nothing by looking over the employees and asking himself, How little can I get them to take? nor the employee by glaring back and asking, How much can I force him to give? Eventually both will have to turn to the business and ask, How can this industry be made safe and profitable, so that it will be able to provide a sure and comfortable living for all of us? But by no means all employers or all employees will think straight. The habit of acting short-sightedly is a hard one to break. What can be done? Nothing. No rules or laws will affect the changes, but enlightened self-interest will. It is possible to get at a satisfactory standard output for a day 
and taking into consideration the skill to arrive at a rate which will express with fair accuracy the amount of skill and exertion that goes into a job and how much is to be expected from the man in the job in return for the wage without scientific study the employer does not know why he is paying a wage and the worker does not know why he is getting it on the time figures all of the jobs in our factory were standardized and rates set we do not have piecework some of the men are paid by the day and some are paid by the hour but in practically every case there is a required standard output below which a man is not expected to fall were it otherwise neither the workmen nor ourselves would know whether or not wages were being earned there must be a fixed day's work before a real wage can be paid watchmen are paid for presence workmen are paid for work having these facts in hand we announced and put into operation in january nineteen fourteen a kind of profit-sharing plan in which the minimum wage for any class of work and under certain conditions was five dollars a day at the same time we reduced the working day to eight hours it had been nine and the week to forty-eight hours this was entirely a voluntary act all of our wage rates have been voluntary it was to our way of thinking an act of social justice and in the last analysis we did for our own satisfaction of mind there is a pleasure in feeling that you have made others happy that you have lessened in some degree the burdens of your fellow men that you have provided a margin out of which may be had pleasure and saving goodwill is one of the few really important assets of life a determined man can win almost anything that he goes after, but unless, in his getting, he gains good will, he has not profited much. There was, however, no charity in any way involved. That was not generally understood. Many employers thought we were just making the announcement because we were prosperous and wanted advertising as they condemned us because we were upsetting standards work under the most scientific and healthful conditions that arrangement will care for some seasonal industries others can arrange a succession of products according to the seasons and the equipment and still others can with more careful management iron out their seasons a complete study of any specific problem will show the way the periodic depressions are more serious because they seem so vast as to be uncontrollable until the whole reorganization is brought about they cannot be wholly controlled but each man in business can easily do something for himself while benefiting his own organization in a very material way also help others the ford production has not reflected good times or bad times it has kept right on, regardless of conditions, excepting from 1917 to 1919, when the factory was turned over to war work. The year 1912 to 1913 was supposed to be a dull one, although now some call it normal. We all but doubled our sales. 1913 to 1914 was dull. We increased our sales by more than a third. The year 1920 to 1921 is supposed to have been one of the most depressed in history. We sold a million and a quarter cars, or about five times as many as in 1913 to 1914, the normal year. There is no particular secret in it. It is, as is everything else in our business, the inevitable result of the application of a principle which can be applied to any business we now have a minimum wage of six dollars a day paid without reservation the people are sufficiently used to high wages to make supervision unnecessary 
the minimum wage is paid just as soon as a worker has qualified in his production, which is a matter that depends upon his own desire to work. We have put our estimate of profits into the wage and are now paying higher wages than during the boom times after the war. But we are, as always, paying them on the basis of work. And that the men do work is evidenced by the fact that, although $6 a day is the minimum wage, about 60% of the workers receive above the minimum. The $6 is not a flat of stocks before making new engagements. The markets were stagnant, but not saturated with goods. What is called a saturated market is only one in which the prices are above the purchasing power. Unduly high prices are always a sign of unsound business, because they are always due to some abnormal condition. A healthy patient has a normal temperature. A healthy market has normal prices. High prices come about commonly by reason of speculation following the report of a shortage. Although there is never a shortage in everything, a shortage in just a few important commodities, or even in one, serves to start speculation. Or, again, goods may not be short at all. An inflation of currency or credit will cause a quick bulge in apparent buying power and the consequent opportunity to speculate. There may be a combination of actual shortages and a currency inflation, as frequently happens during war. But in any condition of unduly high prices, no matter what the real cause, the people pay the high prices because they think there is going to be a shortage. They may buy bread ahead of their own needs, so as not to be left later in the lurch, or they may buy in the hope of reselling at a profit. When there was talk of a sugar shortage, housewives who never in their lives bought more than 10 pounds of sugar at once tried to get stocks of 100 or 200 pounds, and while they were doing this, speculators were buying sugar to store in warehouses. Nearly all our war shortages were caused by speculation or buying ahead of need. No matter how short the supply of an article is supposed to be, no matter if the government takes control and seizes every ounce of that article, a man who is willing to pay the money can always get whatever supply he is willing to pay for. No one ever knows actually how great or how small is the national stock of any commodity. The very best figures are not more than guesses. Estimates of the world's stock of a commodity are still wilder. We may think we know how much of a commodity is produced on a certain day or in a certain month, but that does not tell us how much will be produced the next day of business. For if one is selling on the ordinary basis of profit, that is, on the basis of taking as much money away from the consumer as he will give up, then surely the consumer ought to have a wide range of choice. Standardization, then, is the final stage of the process. We start with consumer, work back through the design, and finally arrive at manufacturing. The manufacturing becomes a means to the end of service. It is important to bear this order in mind. As yet, the order is not thoroughly understood. The price relation is not understood. The notion persists that prices ought to be kept up. On the contrary, good business, large consumption, depends on their going down. And here is another point. The service must be the best you can give. It is considered good manufacturing practice, and not bad ethics, occasionally to change designs so that old models will become obsolete, and new ones will have to be bought, either because repair parts for the old cannot be had, 
or because the new model offers a new sales argument which can be used to persuade a consumer to scrap what he has and buy something new. We have been told that this is good business, that it is clever business, that the object of business ought to be to get people to buy frequently, and that it is bad business to try to make anything that will last forever, because when once a man is sold, he will not buy again. Our principle of business is precisely to the contrary. We cannot conceive how to serve a consumer unless we make for him something that, as far as we can provide, will last forever. We want to construct some kind of a machine that will last forever. It does not please us to have a buyer's car wear out or become obsolete. We want the man who buys one of our products never to have to buy another. We never make an improvement that renders any previous model obsolete. The parts of a specific model are not only interchangeable with all other cars of that model, but they are interchangeable with similar parts on all the cars that we have turned out. You can take a car of ten years ago Chapter 11 of My Life and Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 11. Money and Goods. The primary object of a manufacturing business is to produce, and if that objective is always kept, finance becomes a wholly secondary matter that has largely to do with bookkeeping. My own financial operations have been very simple. I started with the policy of buying and selling for cash, keeping a large fund of cash always on hand, taking full advantage of all discounts, and collecting interest on bank balances. I regard a bank principally as a place in which it is safe and convenient to keep money. The minutes we spend on a competitor's business, we lose on our own. The minutes we spend in becoming expert in finance, we lose in production. The place to finance a manufacturing business is the shop and not the bank. I would not say that a man in business needs to know nothing at all about finance, but he is better off knowing too little than too much, for if he becomes too expert, he will get into the way of thinking that he can borrow money instead of earning it, and then he will borrow more money to pay back what he has borrowed, and instead of being a businessman, he will be a note juggler, trying to keep in the air a regular flock of bonds and notes. If he is a really expert juggler, he may keep going quite a long time in this fashion, but some day he is bound to make a miss, and the whole collection will come tumbling down around him. Manufacturing is not to be confused with banking, and I think that there is a tendency for too many businessmen to mix up in banking, and for too many bankers to mix up in business. The tendency is to distort the true purposes of both business and banking, and that hurts both of them. The money has to come out of the shop, not out of the bank, and I have not merely the profit or solvency of a company. It also comprehends the amount of money that the company turns back to the community through wages. There is no charity in this. There is no charity in proper wages. It is simply that no company can be said to be stable, which is not so well managed that it can afford a man an opportunity to do a great deal of work, and therefore to earn a good wage. There is something sacred about wages. 
They represent homes and families and domestic destinies. People ought to tread very carefully when approaching wages. On the cost sheet, wages are mere figures. Out in the world, wages are bread boxes and coal bins, babies' cradles and children's education, family comforts and contentment. On the other hand, there is something just as sacred about capital, which is used to provide the means by which work can be made productive. Nobody is helped if our industries are sucked dry of their lifeblood. There is something just as sacred about a shop that employs thousands of men as there is about a home. The shop is the mainstay of all the finer things which the home represents. If we want the home to be happy, we must contrive to keep the shop busy. The whole justification of the profits made by the shop is that they are used to make doubly secure the homes dependent on that shop and to create more jobs for other men. If profits go to swell a personal fortune, that is one thing. If they go to provide a sounder basis for business, better working conditions, better wages, more extended employment, that is quite another thing. Capital thus employed should not be carelessly tampered with. It is for the service of all, though it may be under the direction of one. Profits belong in three places. They belong to the business, to keep it steady, progressive, and sound. They belong to the men, who helped produce them. And they belong also, in part, to the public. A successful business is profitable to all three of these interests, planner, producer, and purchaser. People whose profits are excessive when men from stock bought at boom prices. The cut created a considerable sensation. We received a deal of criticism. It was said that we were disturbing conditions. That is exactly what we were trying to do. We wanted to do our part in bringing prices from an artificial to a natural level. I am firmly of the opinion that if at this time or earlier manufacturers and distributors had all made drastic cuts in their prices and had put through thorough house cleanings, we should not have so long a business depression. Hanging on in the hope of getting higher prices simply delayed adjustment. Nobody got the higher prices they hoped for, and if the losses had been taken all at once, not only would the productive and the buying powers of the country have become harmonized, but we should have been saved this long period of general idleness. Hanging on in the hope of higher prices merely made the losses greater, because those who hung on had to pay interest on their high-priced stocks and also lost the profits they might have made by working on a sensible basis. Unemployment cut down wage distribution, and thus the buyer and the seller became more and more separated. There was a lot of flurried talk of arranging to give vast credits to Europe, the idea being that thereby the high-priced stocks might be palmed off. Of course, the proposals were not put in any such crude fashion, and I think that quite a lot of people sincerely believed that if large credits were extended abroad, even without a hope of the payment of either principal or interest, American business would somehow be benefited. It is true that if these credits were taken by American banks, those who had high-priced stocks might have gotten rid of them at a profit, but the banks would have acquired so much frozen credit that they would have more nearly resembled ice houses than banks. I suppose it is natural to hang on to the possibility of profits until the very last moment, but it is not good business. Our own sales, after the cut, increased but soon they began to fall off again. 
we were not sufficiently within the purchasing power of the country to make buying easy. Retail prices generally had not touched bottom. Now is the time to give it. The days are fast slipping away when the fear of credit curtailment will avail, or when wordy slogans will affright. The people are naturally conservative. They are more conservative than the financers. Those who believe that the people are so easily led that they would permit printing presses to run off money like milk tickets do not understand them. It is the innate conservation of the people that has kept our money good in spite of the fantastic tricks which the financiers play and which they cover up with high technical terms. The people are on the side of sound money. They are so unalterably on the side of sound money that it is a serious question how they would regard the system under which they live if they once knew what the initiated can do without. The present money system is not going to be changed by speech-making or political sensationalism or economic experiment. It is going to change under the pressure of conditions, conditions that we cannot control and pressure that we cannot control. The conditions are now with us. That pressure is now upon us. The people must be helped to think naturally about money. They must be told what it is, and what makes it money, and what are the possible tricks of the present system which put nations and peoples under control of the few. Money, after all, is extremely simple. It is part of our transportation system. It is a simple and direct method of conveying goods from one person to another. Money is, in itself, most admirable. It is essential. It is not intrinsically evil. It is one of the most useful devices in social life. And when it does what it was intended to do, it is all help and no hindrance. But money should always be money. A foot is always twelve inches, but when is a dollar a dollar? If ton weights changed in the coal yard and peck measures changed in the grocery and yardsticks were today forty-two inches and tomorrow thirty-three inches by some occult process called exchange, the people would mighty soon remedy that. When a dollar is not always a dollar, when the one hundred cent dollar becomes the sixty-five cent dollar and use is better than to teach him to save, most men who are laboriously saving a few dollars would do better to invest those few dollars first in themselves, and then in some useful work. Eventually, they would have more to save. Young men ought to invest rather than save. They ought to invest in themselves to increase creative value. After they have taken themselves to the peak of usefulness, then will be the time enough to think of laying aside, as a fixed policy, a certain substantial share of income. You are not saving when you prevent yourself from becoming more productive. You are really taking away from your ultimate capital. You are reducing the value of one of nature's investments. The principle of use is the true guide. Use is positive, active, life-giving. Use is alive. Use adds to the sum of good. Personal want may be avoided without changing the general condition. Wage increases, price increases, profit increases, other kinds of increases designed to bring more money here or money there are only attempts of this or that class to get out of the fire, regardless of what may happen to everyone else. There is a foolish belief that if only the money can be gotten, Somehow the storm can be weathered. Labor believes that if it can get more wages, it can weather the storm. Capital thinks that if it can get more profits, it can weather the storm. There is a pathetic faith in what money can do. Money is very useful in normal times, 
but money has no more value than the people put into it by production and it can be so misused it can be so superstitiously worshipped as a substitute for real wealth as to destroy its value altogether the idea persists that there exists an essential conflict between industry and the farm there is no such conflict it is nonsense to say that because the cities are overcrowded everybody ought to go back to the farm if everybody did so farming would soon decline as a satisfactory occupation it is not more sensible for everyone to flock to the manufacturing towns if the farms be deserted of what use are manufacturers a reciprocity can exist between farm was put into production about a year before we had intended because of the allies wartime food emergency and that all of our early production aside of course from the trial and experimental machines went directly to england we sent in all five thousand tractors across the sea in the critical nineteen seventeen to eighteen period when the submarines were busiest every one of them arrived safely and officers of the british government have been good enough to say that without their aid england could scarcely have met its food crisis it was these tractors run mostly by women that ploughed up the old estates and golf courses and let all england be planted and cultivated without taking away from the fighting man power or crippling the forces in the munitions factories it came about in this way the english food administration about the time that we entered the war in nineteen seventeen saw that with the german submarines torpedoing a freighter almost every day the already low supply of shipping was going to be totally inadequate to carry the american troops across the seas to carry the essential munitions for these troops and the allies to carry the food for the fighting forces and at the same time carry enough food for the home population of england it was then that they began shipping out of england the wives and families of the colonials and made plans for the growing of crops at home the situation was a grave one there were not enough draft animals in all england to plough and cultivate land to raise crops in sufficient volume to make even a dent in the food imports power farming was scarcely known for the english farms were not before the war big enough to warrant the purchase of heavy expensive farm machinery and especially with agricultural labor so cheap and plentiful various concerns in england made tractors but they were heavy affairs and mostly run by steam there were not enough of them to go around more could not easily be made for all the factories were working on munitions and even if they had been made they were too big and clumsy for the average field and in addition required the management of actors the work flows exactly as with the automobiles each part is a separate departmental undertaking and each part as it is finished joins the conveyor system which leads it to its proper initial assembly and eventually into the final assembly everything moves and there is no skilled work the capacity of the present plant is one million tractors a year that is the number we expect to make for the world needs inexpensive general utility power plants more now than ever before and also it now knows enough about machinery to want such plants the first tractors as i have said went to england they were first offered in the United States in 1918 at $750. In the next year, with the higher costs, the price had to be made $885. In the middle of the year, 
it was possible again to make the introductory price of $750. In 1920, we charged $790. In the next year, we were sufficiently familiar with the production to begin cutting. The price came down to 625 and then in 1922, with the River Rouge plant functioning, we were able to cut to $395. All of which shows what getting into scientific production will do to a price. Just as I have no idea how cheaply the Ford automobile can eventually be made, I have no idea how cheaply the tractor can eventually be made. It is important that it shall be cheap, otherwise power will not go to all the farms, and they must all of them have power. Within a few years, a farm depending solely on horse and hand power will be as much of a curiosity as a factory run by a treadmill. The farmer must either take up power or go out of business. The cost figures make this inevitable. During the war, the government made a test of a Fordson tractor to see how its costs compared with doing the work with horses. The figures on the tractor were taken at the high price plus freight. The depreciation and repair items are not so great as the report sets them forth, and even if they were, and I believe that it can be. I have personally been experimenting with a trade school and a hospital to discover if such institutions, which are commonly regarded as benevolent, cannot be made to stand on their own feet. I have found that they can be. I am not in sympathy with the trade school as it is commonly organized. The boys get only a smattering of knowledge, and they do not learn how to use that knowledge. The trade school should not be a cross between a technical college and a school. It should be a means of teaching boys to be productive. If they are put at useless tasks, making articles and then throwing them away, they cannot have the interest or acquire the knowledge which is their right, and during the period of schooling, the boy is not productive. The schools, unless by charity, make no provision for the support of the boy. Many boys need support. They must work at the first thing which comes to hand. They have no chance to pick and choose. When the boy thus enters life untrained, he but adds to the already great scarcity of competent labor. Modern industry requires a degree of ability and skill which neither early quitting of school nor long continuance at school provides. It is true that, in order to retain the interest of the boy and train him in handicraft, Manual training departments have been introduced in the more progressive school systems, but even these are confessedly makeshifts because they only cater to, without satisfying, the normal boy's creative instincts. To meet this condition, to fulfill the boy's educational possibilities, and at the same time begin his industrial training along constructive lines, the Henry Ford Trade School was incorporated in 1916. We do not use the word philanthropy in connection with this effort. It grew out of a desire to aid the boy whose circumstances compelled him to leave school early. This desire to aid fitted in conveniently with the necessity of providing trained tool makers in the shops. From the beginning, we have held to three cardinal principles. First, that the boy was to be kept a boy and not changed into a premature working man, as the type of cases may require. No one nurse ever has more than seven patients to care for, and because of the arrangements, it is entirely possible for a nurse to care for seven patients who are not desperately ill. In the ordinary hospital, the nurses must take many useless steps. More of their time is spent in walking 
than in caring for the patient. This hospital is designed to save steps. Each floor is complete in itself, and just as in the factories, we have tried to eliminate the necessity for waste motion. So have we also tried to eliminate waste motion in the hospital. The charge to patients for a room, nursing, and medical attendance is $4.50 a day. This will be lowered as the size of the hospital increases. The charge for a major operation is $125. The charge for minor operations is according to a fixed scale. All of the charges are tentative. The hospital has a cost system just like a factory. The charges will be regulated to make ends just meet. There seems to be no good reason why the experiment should not be successful. Its success is purely a matter of management and mathematics. The same kind of management which permits a factory to give the fullest service will permit a hospital to give the fullest service and at prices so low as to be within the reach of everyone. The only difference between hospital and factory accounting is that I do not expect the hospital to return a profit. We do not expect it to cover depreciation. The investment in this hospital to date is about $9 million. If we can get away from charity, the funds that now go into charitable enterprises can be turned to furthering production, to making goods cheaply and in great plenty. And then we shall not only be removing the burden of taxes from the community and freeing men, but also we can be adding to the general wealth. We leave for private interest too many things we ought to do for ourselves as a collective interest. We need more constructive thinking in public service. We need a kind of universal training in economic facts. The overreaching ambitions of speculative capital, as well as the unreasonable demands of irresponsible labor, and a good part of it would not run at all. All of the buildings were dirty, unpainted, and generally run down. The roadbed was something more than a streak of rust and something less than a railway. The repair shops were overmanned and under-machined. Practically everything connected with operation was conducted with a maximum of waste. There was, however, an exceedingly ample executive and administration department, and of course a legal department. The legal department alone cost in one month nearly $18,000. We took over the road in March 1921. We began to apply industrial principles. There had been an executive office in Detroit. We closed that up and put the administration into the charge of one man and gave him half of the flat-top desk out in the freight office. The legal department went with the executive offices. There is no reason for so much litigation in connection with railroading. Our people quickly settled all the mass of outstanding claims some of which had been hanging on for years. As new claims arise, they are settled at once and on the facts, so that the legal expense seldom exceeds $200 a month. All of the unnecessary accounting and red tape were thrown out, and the payroll of the road was reduced from 2,700 to 1,650 men. Following our general policy, all titles and offices, other than those required by law, were abolished. The ordinary railway organization is rigid. A message has to go up through a certain line of authority, and no man is expected to do anything without explicit orders from his superior. One morning, I went out to the road very early and found a wrecking train with steam up, a crew aboard, and all ready to start. It had been awaiting orders for half an hour. We went down and cleared the wreck before the orders came through. That was before the idea of personal responsibility had soaked in. It was a little hard to break the orders habit. 
The men at first were afraid to take responsibility, but as we went on, they seemed to like the plan more and more, and now no man limits his duties. A man is paid for a day's work of eight hours, and he is expected to work during those eight hours, if he is an engineer. These criticisms had not made any impression on me. I was working ahead with all my might, but being in the same room with Edison suggested to me that it would be a good idea to find out if the master of electricity thought it was going to be the only power in the future. So, after Mr. Edison had finished his address, I managed to catch him alone for a moment. I told him what I was working on. At once he was interested. He is interested in every search for new knowledge. And then I asked him if he thought that there was a future for the internal combustion engine. He answered something in this fashion. Yes, there is a big future for any lightweight engine that can develop a high horsepower and be self-contained. No one kind of motive power is ever going to do all the work of the country. We do not know what electricity can do, but I take for granted that it cannot do everything. Keep on with your engine. If you can get what you are after, I can see a great future. That is characteristic of Edison. He was the central figure in the electrical industry, which was then young and enthusiastic. The rank and file of the electrical men could see nothing ahead but electricity, but their leader could see with crystal clearness that no one power could do all the work of the country. I suppose that is why he was the leader. Such was my first meeting with Edison. I did not see him again until many years after, until our motor had been developed and was in production. He remembered perfectly our first meeting. Since then, we have seen each other often. He is one of my closest friends, and we together have swapped many an idea. His knowledge is almost universal. He is interested in every conceivable subject, and he recognizes no limitations. He believes that all things are possible. At the same time, he keeps his feet on the ground. He goes forward step by step. He regards impossible as a description for that which we have not at the moment the knowledge to achieve. He knows that as we amass knowledge, we build the power to overcome the impossible. That is the rational way of doing the impossible. The irrational way is to make the attempt without the toil of accumulating knowledge. Mr. Edison is of delusions. We ought to wish for every nation as large a degree of self-support as possible. Instead of wishing to keep them dependent on us for what we manufacture, we should wish them to learn to manufacture themselves and build up a solidly founded civilization. When every nation learns to produce the things which it can produce, we shall be able to get down to a basis of serving each other along those special lines in which there can be no competition. The North Temperate Zone will never be able to compete with the tropics in the special products of the tropics. Our country will never be a competitor with the Orient in the production of tea, nor with the South in the production of rubber. A large proportion of our foreign trade is based on the backwardness of our foreign customers. Selfishness is a motive that would preserve that backwardness. Humanity is a motive that would help the backward nations to a self-supporting basis. Take Mexico, for example. We have heard a great deal about the development of Mexico. Exploitation is the word that ought instead to be used. When its rich natural resources are exploited for the increase of the private fortunes of foreign capitalists, that is not development. It is ravishment. You can never develop Mexico until you develop the Mexican. And yet how much of the development of Mexico 
by foreign exploiters ever took account of the development of its people. The Mexican peon has been regarded as mere fuel for the foreign money makers. Foreign trade has been his degradation. Short-sighted people are afraid of such counsel. They say, what would become of our foreign trade? When the natives of Africa began raising their own cotton, and the natives of Russia began making their own farming implements, and the natives of China began supplying their own wants, it will make a difference, to be sure. But does any thoughtful man imagine that the world can long continue on the present basis of a few nations supplying the needs of the world? We must think in terms of what the world will be when civilization becomes general, when obviously described by antagonists as the Jewish campaign, the attack on the Jews, the anti-Semitic pogrom, and so forth, needs no explanation to those who have followed it. Its motives and purposes must be judged by the work itself. It is offered as a contribution to a question which deeply affects the country, a question which is racial at its source, and which concerns influences and ideals rather than persons. Our statements must be judged by candid readers who are intelligent enough to lay our words alongside life as they are able to observe it. If our word and their observation agree, the case is made. It is perfectly silly to begin to damn us before it has been shown that our statements are baseless or reckless. The first item to be considered is the truth of what we have set forth, and that is precisely the item which our critics choose to evade. Readers of our articles will see at once that we are not actuated by any kind of prejudice, except it may be a prejudice in favor of the principles which have made our civilization. There had been observed in this country certain streams of influence which were causing a marked deterioration in our literature, amusements, and social conduct. Business was departing from its old-time substantial soundness, a general letting down of standards was felt everywhere. It was not the robust coarseness of the white man, the rude indelicacy, say, of Shakespeare's characters, but a nasty Orientalism which has insidiously affected every channel of expression, and to such an extent that it was time to challenge it. The fact that these influences are all traceable to one racial source is a fact to be reckoned with, not by us only, but by the intelligent people of the race in question. It is entirely creditable to them that steps have been taken by them to remove their protection from the more flagrant violators of American hospitality, but there is still room to discard outworn ideas of racial superiority maintained by economic or intellectually subversive warfare upon Christian society. The public pays for all mismanagement. More than half the trouble with the world today is the soldiering and dilution and cheapness and inefficiency for which the people are paying their good money. Wherever two men are being paid for what one can do, the people are paying double what they ought, and it is a fact that only a little while ago in the United States, man for man, we were not producing what we did for several years previous to the war. A day's work means more than merely being on duty at the shop for the required number of hours. It means giving an equivalent in service for the wage drawn and when that equivalent is tampered with either way, when the man gives more than he receives, or receives more than he gives, it is not long before serious dislocation will be manifest. Extend that condition throughout the country, and you have a complete upset of business. 
All that industrial difficulty means is the destruction of basic equivalents in the shop. Management must share the blame with labor. Management has been lazy, too. Management has found it easier to hire an additional 500 men than to so improve its methods that 100 men of the old force could be released to other work. The public was paying, and business was booming, and management didn't care a pin. It was no different in the office from what it was in the shop. The law of equivalence was broken just as much by managers as by workmen. Practically nothing of importance is secured by mere demand. That is why strikes always fail, even though they may seem to succeed. A strike which brings higher wages or shorter hours and passes on the burden to the community is really unsuccessful. It only makes the industry less able to serve and decreases the number of jobs that it can support. This is not to say that no strike is justified. It may draw attention to an evil. Men can strike with justice. That they will thereby get justice is another question. The strike for proper conditions and just rewards is justifiable. The pity is that men should be compelled to use the strike to get what is theirs by right. No American ought to be compelled to strike for his rights. He ought to receive them naturally, easy from a different point of view to make the very bad system of the past into a very good system of the future. We are displacing that peculiar virtue, which used to be admired as hard-headedness, and which was really only wooden-headedness, with intelligence, and also we are getting rid of mushy sentimentalism. The first confused hardness with progress. The second confused softness with progress. We are getting a better view of the realities, and are beginning to know that we have already in the world all things needful for the fullest kind of a life, and that we shall use them better once we learn what they are and what they mean. Whatever is wrong, and we all know that much is wrong, can be righted by a clear definition of the wrongness. We have been looking so much at one another, at what one has and another lacks, and we have made a personal affair out of something that is too big for personalities. To be sure, human nature enters largely into our economic problems. Selfishness exists, and doubtless it colors all the competitive activities of life. If selfishness were the characteristic of any one class, it might be easily dealt with, but it is in human fiber everywhere, and greed exists, and envy exists, and jealousy exists. But as the struggle for mere existence grows less, and it is less than it used to be, although the sense of uncertainty may have increased, we have an opportunity to release some of the finer motives. We think less of the frills of civilization as we grow used to them, Progress, as the world has thus far known it, is accompanied by a great increase in the things of life. There is more gear, more wrought material, in the average American backyard than the whole domain of an African king. The average American boy has more paraphernalia around him than a whole Eskimo community. The utensils of a kitchen, dining room, bedroom, and coal cellar make a list that would have staggered the most luxurious potentate of five hundred years ago. The increase in the impedimenta of life only marks a stage. We are like the Indian, who comes into a town with all his money and buys everything he sees. There is no adequate realization of the large proportion of the labor and material of industry we have been sending certain goods through only one channel, and when that use is slack, or that channel is stopped, business stops too, and all the sorry consequences of depression set in. Take corn, for example. There are millions upon millions of bushels of corn stored in the United States with no visible outlet. 
A certain amount of corn is used as food for man and beast, but not all of it. In pre-prohibition days, a certain amount of corn went into the making of liquor, which was not a very good use for good corn. But through a long course of years, corn followed those two channels, and when one of them stopped, the stocks of corn began to pile up. It is the money fiction that usually retards the movement of stocks, but even if money were plentiful, we could not possibly consume the stores of food which we sometimes possess. If foodstuffs become too plentiful to be consumed as food, why not find other uses for them? Why use corn only for hogs and distilleries? Why sit down and bemoan the terrible disaster that has befallen the corn market? Is there no use for corn besides the making of pork or the making of whiskey? Surely there must be. There should be so many uses for corn that the only important uses could ever be fully served. There ought always be enough channels open to permit corn to be used without waste. Once upon a time, the farmers burned corn as fuel. Corn was plentiful and coal was scarce. That was a crude way to dispose of corn, but it contained the germ of an idea. There is fuel in corn, oil and fuel alcohol are obtainable from corn, and it is high time that someone was opening up this new use so that the stored-up corn crops may be moved. Why have only one string to our bow? Why not two? If one breaks, there is the other. If the hog business slackens, why should not the farmer turn his corn into tractor fuel? We need more diversity all round. The four-track system everywhere would not be a bad idea. We have a single-track money system. It is a mighty fine system for those who own it. It is a perfect system for the interest-collecting, credit-controlling financers who literally own the commodity called money and who literally own